we're going to be focusing upon the, the very center of the faith. It's a sacrament and it's a sacrifice in which our Lord Jesus Christ not only establishes a covenant, but really is the covenant. And the sacrament, it, it contains our Lord Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, but it's also an offering. And so in the Eucharist, our Lord Jesus Christ's body and blood, soul, and divinity is offered to the Father continually in an unbloody manner. And then, finally, it's also, now it's not just contained, it's not just offered, but it's received. And all three of those elements are crucial to understanding how the Eucharist is both a sacrifice and a sacrament. And when it's received, we call that Holy Communion. All three of those belong together. They're inseparable. They're critical. Now, we've got to say one thing right off the bat. We are talking about an unbloody sacrifice, and we are talking about a sacrifice where Christ's death is represented. We are not talking about a bloody sacrifice where Christ is still bleeding. We are not talking about the fact that Christ is still dying on Calvary. He's not dying. He's been buried. He's been raised. He's ascended. He's enthroned, and there he is in glory. But as he is in glory, he is the Lamb of God, enthroned as the Paschal Lamb. And so all of this belongs together in a very deep and mysterious way. And I, for one, do not pretend to believe or pretend to think that I can really encapsulate or summarize it all adequately. Now, let's just also remind ourselves of another important theological doctrine. God is omnipresent. God is present everywhere. But Jesus Christ... In his humanity, that is, the flesh and the blood that he assumed for himself from the Blessed Virgin Mary, that is only in heaven. That is spatially limited. In addition to its space, to its place in heaven, however, we also say that through the miracle of the Mass and the Eucharist, Jesus Christ not just in his divine nature, which is present everywhere, but in his human nature, is present on the altars of the church around the world as Mass is celebrated daily approximately 300,000 times each day. So we're talking about the humanity of Jesus Christ, which is inseparably united to his divinity. So in order, this is, this is done, of course, to establish the new covenant. Jesus Christ wants to be with us. His name, in a sense, is Emmanuel. God with us. God is with us in such a unique way with the new covenant that we have to say it's a completely different kind of covenant because in the Old Testament, the covenants were all preparations. In a sense, the, the, the first time the covenant is mentioned is explicitly is with Noah, and, the, and the, the covenant is that rainbow. And so that covenant prepares for Christ because we see that when the Lamb's enthroned in Revelation 4 and 5, around his throne is that rainbow. And then the next covenant is with Abraham and Isaac, and that oath covenant is established in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah when Abraham was ready to sacrifice his only beloved son, but God stopped him. That covenant was not really completed until Jesus Christ, God the Father's only beloved firstborn son, went to Moriah to a peak called Calvary, and there he was offered. And on it goes, when Moses led the people out of Egypt into Mount Sinai, and he and he slew the animals, and he took the blood, and he threw it upon the people, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant. Those exact words were taken by Jesus in the upper room when he instituted the Eucharist, only to insert the word new covenant, but it's there practically verbatim. Because what Moses was doing was only a symbol and a shadow of what Christ would really accomplish. And likewise, when David, seeing in himself and then in his, in his firstborn son and his son Solomon, a priest king after the order of Melchizedek, there in Salem, there in Jerusalem, you know, as he took the ark up and as he requested the building of the temple and as he gave the people bread and wine, all of this was a shadowy anticipation of what Christ would accomplish. But it was only a partial picture. So how can we possibly exhaust the meaning and beauty of the sacrament? It's impossible, but we can say this. God is not done in history until he is with us, until he is one of us. For the first time in history with the new covenant, God is the covenant in his human nature. The Christian religion is the only religion established on the basis of, of a divine oath. All religions have divine oaths in this sense that we swear oaths to God.
So help me, God. Curse me, God, if I don't fulfill this promise. But only in the Jewish scriptures and in the fulfillment of the Christian New Covenant do we have God swearing the oath, pronouncing upon himself the curse, and then establishing in his own body and blood the covenant. Absolutely unique and distinct. Now, before I go on, I want to just read to you some quotations from early church fathers about the Eucharist to give to you an awareness that this is not some innovation. This is not some novel invention in the Middle Ages. For instance, there at the end of the first century, St. Ignatius of Antioch, disciple of the beloved disciple, John, spoke of the heretics who were plaguing the church in his day, quote, they abstained from the Eucharist because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a perennial problem, isn't it? Then St. Justin Martyr, in the second century, one of the great apologists, defenders of the faith, stated, quote, This food is known among us as the Eucharist. We do not receive these things as common bread and common drink, but as Jesus Christ, our Savior, being made flesh by the word of God. And then in the fourth century, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, another venerable church father, wrote, Since then he has declared and said of the bread, This is my body. Who after that will venture to doubt? And seeing that he has affirmed and said, this is my blood, who will raise a question and say it is not his blood? And so we have testimony throughout all of the first centuries of the church to this effect. You are hard-pressed. In fact, I would say it's practically impossible to find a single statement by anybody in the first eight centuries of, of the church where you have a denial of the real presence of Jesus Christ, flesh and blood, body, soul, and divinity there in the Eucharist. And I remember when I first discovered that, I was still anti-Catholic, but boy, did that bother me. Because I wondered, how could John's disciple get it so wrong? How could St. Ignatius say something so patently false and superstitious after spending all this time at the feet of the beloved disciple, St. John? Well, now I'm, I'm convinced that he didn't get it wrong. Now I'm convinced Vatican II got it right when it said, in the sacrament of the Eucharist, the unity of believers who form one body in Christ is both experienced and brought about. We are, in a sense, what we eat. We're only the supernatural body of Christ because in the Eucharist, we receive the supernatural body of Christ. Now, before I go on and summarize those two talks, I'd like to call your attention to something you've probably heard many, many times. It's taken from the Eucharistic prayer, number one, the Roman canon. First of all, just to kind of summarize the whole approach we've taken all week long. Father, accept this offering from your whole family. In the middle of the Mass, we are told what we are. And we are told what we are doing. And that is we are praising and loving and sacrificing and worshiping our Father as He gathers His family. And then it goes on in the same prayer to speak about God, we say, Father, we celebrate the memory of Christ, your Son, etc. Look with favor on these offerings and accept them as once you accepted the gifts of your servant Abel, who offered himself as an oblation. It was a perfect sacrifice of his own body and blood in an act of martyrdom. A very substantial image of Christ, but not perfect because it wasn't voluntary. It was involuntary. It's murder. The sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith who offered his only beloved son on Moriah. Another very powerful symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ, but then he didn't really kill him, did he? So it's only an inadequate image. And the bread and wine offered by your priest Melchizedek. Now, that's taken from Genesis 14, where it says, after his return from the, de the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings, the four kings were with him, goes on to talk about the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, which we said in another setting, later is called Jerusalem, Psalm 76 shows us that, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, for he was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram. This is the first time in the Bible that the word Kohen in Hebrew for priest is used. He was the priest. He brought out bread and wine. And those two things are in close conjunction. He brought out bread and wine, and then it says he was a priest. Well, what's the connection? Well, back then, the priest did not need to offer the bloody sacrifices. 
Those only became necessary, we learn in Exodus 8 and Ezekiel 20, when Israel becomes enslaved and addicted to the gods of Egypt and to idolatrous customs, which God has got to break by having them sacrifice the gods of Egypt ceremonially at Mount Sinai. But back when we had the patriarchal family religion rooted in nature, what was the sacrifice that pleased God? Well, bread and wine offered by God's priest Melchizedek. The first time that a priest is called, somebody is called a priest, he's offering bread and wine to Abraham, who has come and paid his tithes and receives bread and wine, and then he receives a blessing. Have you ever had that experience where you pay your tithes and then you receive what appears to be bread and wine and then you receive a blessing from a priest? This is the pattern of the Eucharistic liturgy where we give our offerings and then the priest, Christ, working through the human priest, transforms them into his own body and blood and then he gives us that under the appearance of bread and wine and then he gives us the blessing. Now this is going to become very important as we unfold and unpack all of this. But before I go on with Melchizedek, let's just step back and let me summarize these two talks that are on tape. The first talk is the fourth cup. What I did in that talk, I will just summarize rapidly. I was investigating one of the last sayings of Jesus on the cross when he says, it is finished. I had a professor and a pastor friend of mine ask the question from the pulpit, what was Jesus talking about when he said, it is finished? My first response was, well, it's the work of redemption. And he said from the pulpit, you might be tempted to say the work of redemption. And he said, well, actually, if you're going to do careful exegesis and interpret the passage in context, there's no theological, there, there, there's no suggestion of that big theological doctrine there in the context of that passage. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the primary meaning of the text in context? What is the it that is finished? And besides, we can't just summarize and say, well, redemption is completely finished because Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead yet. And St. Paul tells us that he was raised for our justification. So redemption still has to unfold some more. It is finished. Boy, that bothered me. I remember going out and really deciding, re resolving to do some work. So I did. I went back and I went, I think, about five or six chapters backwards in John and I started reading the Synoptic Gospels. And I believe I found a connection with the Passover, and I'll share it with you. Luke 22, verse 15, our Lord says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. So we're assured that the Last Supper in the upper room was a Passover meal. In Mark 14, verses 22 through 26, we, we hear the words of institution. And as they were eating, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank all of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And I thought, huh, I never noticed those words before. I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Elsewhere, you have the same idea expressed in the Gospels, where Jesus says, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until you know, I'm being glorified. And I thought, well, wait a second. When he said, it is finished, he had just taken some sour wine, but oh, you know, I wanted to work on that connection a little bit more. And then I noticed the next phrase, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the night. They went to the Mount of Olives, in fact. Now, something disturbed me because I had been studying the ancient Jewish Passover liturgy for some time and I knew the four cups of the Passover liturgy represent essentially the basic liturgical structure of this meal the first cup is called the Kedush it's uh, the blessing that is pronounced over the first cup the second one actually initiates the Passover liturgy in a technical way the second cup of wine is drunk after you do the, uh, the singing of Psalm 113, which is known as the Little Hillel Psalm. And then the third cup, which is called the Cup of Blessing, is drunk after grace is given. And uh, this, is, uh, this is also done in conjunction with the, with the prayer that is spoken over the bread. But what is so significant about this is that after the third cup, but before the fourth and final cup, the Hillel Psalms are sung. It's one great hallelujah song. We get the word hallel, or I should say hallelujah, from hallel, which means praise Yah, Yahweh, hallelujah. 
And the Hallel Psalms 114 through 118 constitute a gorgeous and majestic song of praise to Yahweh. And as soon as the third cup is drunk, you go ahead and sing that song of the Hallel Psalms, and then you proceed to the fourth cup of consummation, which is the climax of the Passover. What's so odd, and what many scholars have noticed, is that Jesus, it says they sang a hymn, which is obviously the Hillel Psalm, there's really no disputing that point. And then, you know, Jews who read this expect them to go on and read, to, to uh, drink the fourth cup, but it says they went out into the night. And right after they drank that third cup, and right before they sang that song, the Hillel Psalms, Jesus said, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom has come. Now, there are actually some scholars who suggest that Jesus botched it. You know, maybe he was just so anxious. But to botch the liturgy at this point would be a disaster. It would be like a priest saying high mass alongside the Pope and forgetting to say the words of consecration. Sure, Jesus is anxious, but the disciples would have stopped him. There would have been something else, I think. Well, somebody could still say, well, you know, maybe he just was just too fearful, you know. Well, I would suggest otherwise. And if we go on a little bit further in the Gospel of Mark, I think we have a good reason to believe that Jesus did this deliberately. He interrupted the Passover liturgy right at its climatic moment. For what purpose? Well, in Mark 14, verse 32, it goes on to read, And they went to a place which was called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, went a little farther. Greatly distressed and troubled, he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And what does he say? He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to thee. Remove this cup. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. What cup? I thought he was scared about dying. Why does he refer to his suffering and death as a cup? Hmm. Careful Jewish Christian readers would see a connection. Why hasn't he partaken of the fourth cup? Why did he interrupt the, the holiest moment of the liturgy? Why does he go out into the night after the Hillel Psalms are sung? Why does he fall down on the ground and then ask the Lord to take this cup away? Now, somebody could say it's a reference to some prophecies found in Isaiah and Jeremiah regarding the cup of suffering. And I think it does have a secondary reference to those. But if we're following closely... The deliberate motions of our Lord, I think it's very plausible to draw a connection between the interrupted Passover liturgy and this anguished prayer of our Lord in the garden. Now, you know how it goes on from here. He's arrested, he's beaten, he's mocked, he's tried, and then he's convicted and sent out to Calvary. And remember when he was carrying his cross, what happened? Mark 15, verse 23 says that on the way up Calvary, they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, which is like an opiate, a great and powerful painkiller, but he didn't take it. After all, he said, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. And it hasn't come at that point, right? And then all of a sudden, we go on, and we discover something I think very, very significant. In John 19, we're told that Jesus, seeing that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Now, he's racked with pain. It's an agonizing death, but he still has presence of mind. In order to fulfill the scripture, he says, I thirst. Now, do you think that man was not thirsty before now? Seconds before his death, is he just noticing, boy, I could use a drink? No. I mean, that would be to trivialize the, the matter. Jesus says, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. John is depicting all of this in very beautiful terms. John is the one who introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God in the first chapter. And now, Jesus has become the high priest, the sacrificer, as well as the victim sacrifice. How do we know? Well, for one thing, John records how Jesus had a linen garment that was uh, without seam. A seamless linen garment is exactly what the priest is supposed to wear as he sacrificed the Passover lamb. And we also know that the hour of sacrifice was the hour when the Passover lamb was slain. We also read on in John 19 and we discover that the two thieves had their legs broken. 
But Jesus didn't because he'd already died. Thus to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of his shall be broken. And if you trace it all the way back to the Old Testament origin of this, not a bone of his shall be broken, you go through the Psalms back to Exodus, and you discover that the Passover lamb's bones were not allowed to be broken. And if your lamb had a broken bone, you had to find another one. Priest and victim, and it's all according to a divine plan. And so Jesus says, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And just by coincidence, there's a little sour wine down there, vinegar-like substance. And a man takes a hyssop branch, which incidentally and coincidentally was what you used to sprinkle the lamb's blood over the doorpost. He takes a hyssop branch with a sponge at the end where there's sour wine dipped in it, and he lifts it up to Christ, and Christ says, No, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine. No, he doesn't say that. This time he receives it, and he says, it is finished. What is it? The Passover begun in the upper room. It is now consummated. The fourth cup, the cup of God's wrath, the cup of consummation, wasn't drunk in the fourth, I mean, in the upper room. The reason why Jesus does this, I believe, is to show us that the Passover sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the firstborn son and the priest, begins not at the foot of Calvary, but in the upper room. When the Old Testament Passover begins to be transformed by our Lord into the New Covenant Eucharist. And you could also say it this way, that if the Passover isn't finished into Cal until Calvary, I would suggest that Calvary is really begun in the upper room with the Eucharist. When does Jesus' sacrifice really begin? Well, he insists on the fact that his life is not being taken away from him. He is laying it down. Now, in the trial and with the passion, it's being taken away. But in the upper room, prior to all of that, Jesus lays it down. He says, this is my body. This cup is the blood of the new covenant. What happens when you differentiate and separate body and blood? You signify death. When your body and your blood are separated, death begins. That's obvious, I think. So Jesus is symbolically and actually beginning the sacrifice. St. Augustine said that our Lord held himself in his own hands and commenced the sacrifice of the new covenant, Passover, as he was transforming the old. Calvary really began in the Old Testament Passover being celebrated in the upper room when the Eucharist was instituted, and the Passover Eucharist of the New Covenant really isn't over until Calvary, when he says, it is finished. But wait a second, you've got to say one more thing, because way back in Egypt, 1,500 years before, if you had slain the lamb and sprinkled the blood according to Moses' command, and say to yourself, well, thereby my firstborn son will be safe, and you went to bed, you'd be wrong, dead wrong. You'd wake up and he'd be dead. Why? Because one other thing had to take place. You didn't just have to take a, a lamb without blemish, without broken bones, and then sacrifice him and sprinkle his blood. You had to eat the lamb. You had to eat the lamb. I mean, even if you hate mutton, you had to eat the lamb. So in a sense, it is finished. What is the it? The bloody death sacrifice. But is that all sacrifice is? Sometimes non-Catholics find it easy to think that way until they go back into the Old Testament. And as I went back into the Old Testament, it dawned on me that that's really only the first half of the sacrifice. And it really isn't even the, the goal or the end of the sacrifice. The second half of the sacrifice is really what it's all about. God doesn't just want dead bodies and drained blood. He wants peace and he wants love. He wants to restore communion. And how is that symbolically enacted in the Old Testament? By eating the victim in a sacrificial meal. Because that is what restores family communion, and that's what the covenant's all about. So Jesus says it is finished. What is the it? The bloody death sacrifice of the Passover victim and the priest of the new covenant. And so as Catholics, we have always said, he does not die again. He does not continue to suffer. He does not continue to bleed. It is finished. That whole dimension of the sacrifice is finished. What began in the upper room is now finished on the cross. And so he gives up his breath and he dies. He gives up his spirit and he dies.
But the sacrifice of Passover is not complete until you eat the lamb. No wonder St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us, therefore what? Well, therefore we don't have any more sacrificial offerings or ceremonies or feasts and so on to celebrate because all of those ceremonies are outdated and done with. No. He says Christ our Passover has been sacrificed, therefore let us keep the feast. And he goes on to talk about how we take out the leaven of insincerity and we have this unleavened bread. What's he talking about? Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed, therefore we have got to achieve the whole goal of that sacrifice. The second half is communion, where we eat the lamb. Jesus Christ has said to us, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life. Let's turn to John 6 and see the context in which he says that. John 6, verse 4 tells us, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So everything that transpires in John 6 is within the context of the Passover. Jesus is talking to them now. At the time of the Passover, after multiplying these loaves, ending up filling 12 baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves, he uses that as his point of departure for one of the most important sermons he ever preaches and also one of the most disastrous from a human perspective. He goes on talking about this bread. And he goes on talking about Moses in context with that bread. For instance, in verse 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Welfare state. <laughs> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall not thirst. And he goes on talking about this some more. The Jews then murmured at him in verse 41 because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They're thinking, what is he talking about? This guy is Joseph's son. How does he say, I have come down from heaven? They only look at him from a human perspective. They don't see that he's the divine son of God. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. How often did they eat the manna? Every day. How often do we receive the bread of life? Every day. This is not a once-for-all sacrifice like many anti-Catholics allege in the sense that Christ is sacrificed and now there's nothing more to be done. Jesus Christ is sacrificed as priest and as victim, as lamb and as firstborn son. And as the bread of life, he gives himself to us as well as the unleavened bread of the Passover meal, which commenced, of course, the whole feast of unleavened bread the week after the Passover celebration. Jesus Christ is the bread of life, the unleavened bread of God, which came down from heaven, which the Israelites received every day, the manna of the new covenant. Because Christ, through the Holy Spirit, makes himself available as the Lamb of God to be consumed continuously. That's the whole point of the resurrection, incidentally. The Holy Spirit raises up that body and glorifies it so supernaturally that body and blood which is glorified may be internationally distributed through the altars and priests of the church so that all of God's children can be bound back to the Father in the new covenant sacrifice of Christ. He didn't die again. He's not bleeding and he's not suffering. He's reigning in glory and giving us his own flesh and blood. Where do you get that? From the Old Testament. The manna, the Passover, the sacrifice as, as it's described on Calvary as it's initiated in the upper room, and as he states right here in verse 51. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. <gasps> Jews, stop. Wait a second. Hold the phone. Joan, what do you mean, my flesh? Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Cannibalism, paganism, barbarism, sin, in the highest degree. So Jesus said to them, well, I, I didn't mean it, guys. I'm just kind of, you know, using hyperbole or metaphor. No. He actually intensifies the scandal. He actually raises the obstacle even higher. He said to them, truly, tra truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, which Leviticus condemns the drinking of blood. 
unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him.